Welcome to chapter 11 and in this chapter we're going to talk about strategic cost management and then later on kind of the role of just in time and how that uh, traditionally has affected strategic cost management and then what we saw in terms of supply chain disruption with the pandemic uh, and the use of just in time ordering. So strategic decision making is pretty critical in terms of ensuring that not only are uh, decisions designed to create positive outcome, but to allow a, a firm or a company to sustain itself over the long haul. Uh, I could decide to cut my prices to the bare bone and undercut every competitor in the market and chase everybody out of the um, the segment that I'm operating in. On the other hand, if I cut my margins so low that I can't actually provide customers with value, I'm going to be out of business very quickly. So having a balance of a, a strategy that will make sure that I am competitive in the short run, but sustainable over the long haul. Now, in order to gain a competitive advantage in my marketplace, I have to provide customers with value and be really cost conscious about where I can, um, what is really necessary versus what's kind of fluff in my budget. In the particular area where my office is located in the Upper Valley, there are a lot of lawyers. I, I'm not sure geographically exactly how many. I've not sort of drawn a map and counted, but there are a lot of lawyers. And in a fairly rural uh, area, there are a limited number of potential customers with money to pay lawyers. So there is pretty stiff competition among the lawyers for the limited amount of client dollars that there are to go around. So how do you set yourself apart from the competition? And the answer is to make sure that you provide value. That I often find that people don't mind paying for something as long as they feel like they got value for the, what they paid for. Uh, you walk into my office and you will not see expensive statues and artwork on the walls and marble floors and costly furniture because in my opinion that doesn't bring value that might make a client feel like they're in a, a, a successful environment but the reality is clients pay for that stuff and I would rather my clients pay me less and not have those things and be a bit more affordable and make sure that what I am spending my client dollars on are value added. Now there are different models for how to achieve a competitive advantage and cost leadership is certainly one of those. Making sure that you are certainly not the cheapest but not the most expensive. So uh, you know I've got the example of Walmart here and Walmart serves a market but in a legal area I every client comes in to me with a different story a different set of circumstances and I have to tailor a solution to that client's circumstances. I can't offer a discount Walmart cut rate service uh, because I wouldn't be able to achieve the results that clients are actually in need of. Uh, I try and offer that sort of that white glove service in that when you call my office you get me. You don't get a receptionist who then transfers you to an assistant who then will take a message and then the lawyer will figure out when they can call you back. It's just me. And so I think, at least I like to believe, that clients prefer to talk to the person that's actually doing the work on their case rather than being relegated to lower end staff folks who may not necessarily have the solutions. And then I try and limit my market segment. Uh, I, I have a colleague that we 
often debate this. Um, he has a law practice area that I would call sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. In other words, anybody who shows up with a dollar, well, okay, not a dollar, but, but with money, he will figure out how to take on that case and sort of figure out how to do that. I consider that grossly inefficient. The areas of the law that I practice are highly complex, highly technical, and if I had to devote the level of um, study to a variety, to, to a substantial number of areas of the law to be as good at lots of things, I wouldn't have any time to do anything. So my focus has been to limit my practice areas and to know them well and to be able to follow the case wherever it should end up and not say to a client halfway through, oh, I thought I could settle your case, but turns out your case has to go to trial and <laughs> I'm not a trial attorney. I would never say that to a client. If I take a case, it is with the idea that uh, you got me soup to, to nuts and I won't take the case if I'm not in a position to see it to its end, regardless of the fairly predictable twists and turns a case might take. So in order to be strategically positioned, the idea is to have a healthy balance of all three of these. You know, you don't want to be the cut rate, you don't want to be the most expensive, you want to give some personal uh, touch, and you want to reasonably limit what you do, but not so much so that if it turns out the market, you know, in the uh, last recession, um, I had colleagues whose practices were solely devoted to real estate. And when the market downturn hit and no one was buying property and there were lots of underwater properties so people couldn't sell, uh, real estate lawyers were very, very hungry. And so without some market differentiation in their practice areas, those lawyers were in dire financial trouble. So again, finding a, a, a good balance um, without adding so many practice areas that you also create conflicts because you've got, you know, multiple courts all needing you at the same time and literally one court doesn't care if another one already wants you someplace else. Um, so again, finding a way to uh, optimally mix those three approaches is the the hallmark of creating a competitive advantage and you know in understanding the entire uh, life chain um, and I will again put this in legal terms because this is what means the most to me but understanding the case that comes through the door and all of the twists and turns that it is likely to take before it reaches its end point and how I'm going to be able to navigate a client through all of that and not say, oh, sorry, um, you know, this is what happened to your case and I don't do that. So now, even though you've paid me a bunch of money, you got to go find somebody else. Um, that is, uh, I think a, a poor strategic decision for a, a business to take regardless of that. Making sure that you can serve your clients throughout the value chain is particularly important. And making sure that you make those linkages so that clients come back. Uh, and I put this little uh, clip art in here. You know, Best Buy has a trade-in program. And not so much, pro well, okay, maybe they are uh, environmentally conscientious and it's good business to worry about the environment and not have electronics sitting in landfills. But the reality is if you bring something in to trade it in at Best Buy, that's a potential customer walking through their door that Best Buy can then use to sell an upgraded product to. So they're not fools. There is certainly a benefit for them and finding a way that you can continue to serve clients and then bring them back uh, is a, a tremendous value um, in creating that external linkage through the value chain. So how does a firm select or a business what it's going to do? Um, 
And as your slide points out, and I'm going to slightly disagree, a firm's activities can be used to produce or sustain a competitive advantage. In my opinion, a firm's activities must be used to produce and sustain a competitive advantage. Otherwise, uh, somebody else is going to. So, uh, and the exploitation of the internal linkages is vital. And uh, and as well as external. And that's why uh, doing things like offering extended warranties for the service of a product is important. Although there is a point at which you can take those things too far. Um, I bought a car a number of years ago through um, a, a dealership, uh, brand new. And with that, and I thought it was a great idea at the time, uh, it came with an extended warranty that had me, um, my car is set every 5,000 miles to tell me that it needs service. Now, my car doesn't need service every 5,000 miles. And the way that it was explained to me is they do this free diagnostic check every 5,000 miles. Um, now, there was a point at which I was driving a lot and it didn't take me very long to hit 5,000 miles and then 10,000 miles. And now all of a sudden, for somebody who drives a lot to have to have to call and make an appointment to get the stupid light to go out on my dashboard was really aggravating. And I would bring the car in and the first time they got me, and I don't know if I bought a cabin air filter or whatever it was, uh, but I left there with my car with 5,000 miles on it. And I thought to myself, did I really need something for a car that I've only driven for, you know, less than a few months? No was the short answer, but they created this linkage by offering, basically telling my car to tell me that it's got to be brought in using the free diagnostic check to then sell me additional products which were outside my warranty. And now that light comes on and I get really irritated uh, and I might take it in and they might look at it, but there is no way I'm going to have them do any work on my car. And the last time I brought it in, they told me what it was going to need. And I said, thank you very much. Took my car back. And they were like, well, don't you want us to do the work? I said, no, nope, no, nope, that's okay. And I took it to the mechanic next door to my office. He did the work for substantially less. And um, so anyway, that is the, I think, the extreme of exploiting a linkage to the point that I probably will not buy this brand of car again uh, as a result of the inconvenience that their effort to create uh, these linkages has caused in my life. Um, so within an organization, we have structural and executional activities. Um, the structural is basically how is our our firm designed in terms of, of shaping activities and then how are we going to execute. For me, my cost driver generally is the hourly billable hour. Uh, now, I certainly also do some flat fee work because clients like some predictability and there are cases that I can assess pretty clearly up front how much time I'm going to invest in that case. and. Uh, based on the hourly rate, I will do it on a sort of a per case basis. Um, but with the underlying driver to make that determination being my uh, billable hour. And so here are some examples of structural activities and structural cost drivers. And I won't, uh, you can pause this and read this. I don't think there's anything earth shattering here. Now, um, executional act activities and executional cost drivers that you could do to determine uh, costing. Uh, we have also operational activities and operational cost drivers and uh, those are divided into unit level and batch level uh, activities and drivers. So again I think these are um, in product uh, level, uh, pretty self-explanatory. So I will not, you can pause these and read these, but uh, I think they're, 
they speak for themselves. Now, the it's important to recognize there's got to be an interrelationship between the activities and the drivers chosen. And these things should all fit together uh, within a continuous loop. You don't want to choose a driver that does not fit within the organizational activity of the, uh, the company, for example. Um, and I'm going to stop here and go on to the next video for uh, value chain analysis.